This is the Bavarian city of Ingolstadt. Well, here we are at the Audi headquarters in Ingolstadt and if you notice, there are two right-hand drive all-new Q7s on this podium. And we are doing a really unique road test, which is we are driving these cars all the way from Germany back home to India. This is the longest road test Autocar has done. This is the great Quattro drive. We're going to tell you every bit about this car, how it performed, fuel consumption, the works. Driving the Q7s all the way to India. So really excited and looking forward to it. Just note down your start order right now. It's been a childhood dream to drive this road uh, from Europe to Asia. You know, to be able to photograph it, it's just like an icing on the cake. And as they were flagged off, the adrenaline levels rose even higher. Unsurprisingly, on the German autobahns, the Q7 proved to be in its comfort zone. And despite the lashing rain, the 375km run to Prague was a breeze. That evening in Prague, everyone was in high spirits as the day wound down. Next morning, the great quarter drive was in the mood for some touristy stuff. But the day had to start early to beat the tourists to the best of location. And a photograph of the Q7 with the astronomical clock from the 15th century was the perfect way to kickstart the day. Then with purpose, we tore into a route that would sweep through the former Iron Curtain. From the Czech Republic, we made for Warsaw in Poland. Clearly, this is going to be one of the smoothest parts of the journey. We are still in Europe where roads are absolutely fantastic and more important, the driving really is very, very disciplined. After doing 200 kilometers an hour on the autobahns of Germany, the Polish highways felt a bit sedate as the Q7 stuck to a steady 120 kph. And this is where the road test of the Q7 began in earnest. So at the very next fuel stop, out came our trusty yellow tread depth gauge. The tyre tread depth was measured and noted, and the Q7's engine was also under scrutiny. I think what's really been amazing is uh, just the way this car performs. It's, it's a 3-litre engine, but it really feels like the 4.2 V8. It's really quick, put your foot down and it really goes. The Q7 was hard at work, while some of the others weren't. Well, we are right now in our Warsaw Hotel parking lot and we spent a large part of the morning trying to just pack all our stuff into the Q7. With the Q7's boot being smaller than before, it wasn't enough on its own. Seats had to be flipped down and thankfully, the India spec spare wheel wasn't there. But it was late in the evening by the time we got our papers cleared. And well past midnight by the time we got to Minsk, the capital of Belarus. Despite the late night, the Great Quattro Drive was out and about early next morning. The National Library with its geometric design was a match for the Audi Q7 and its crisp lines. Then it was time to make a beeline for Moscow and Russia. And this time around, there were no worries when crossing over. And we are now into Russia and there's no real border between Belarus and Russia so getting in has been quite painless. And the first thing we did after crossing the border was fill our tanks because fuel is much cheaper in Russia than it is in Belarus. Well, what we paid for one litre of diesel is around 35-36 rubles and it's one to one to the rupee so that's 35-36 rupees for a litre of diesel. In comparison, in Germany we had paid about 70 rupees per litre. That day, we were in for the long haul, and so Hormuz decided to get some real work done. With the portable Wi-Fi unit switched on and the laptop fired up, he was back at work. But he could think of a few improvements for his new office. The seat cushioning was just a bit too firm, but he loved the touch-sensitive cabin lights, and there's fantastic attention to detail all around the cabin. 
The team autocar got to Moscow well after sunset. But the mood was upbeat as it meant that the Great Quattro Drive had clocked two and a half thousand kilometers already. The Q7s got a well-deserved bath and everyone else was looking forward to a day of rest. Rest? When in a city like Moscow, no way. With St. Basil's Church calling, everyone was up at dawn. And with that tidbit dished out, it was time for a change of hands on the Great Quattro Drive. Oh boy! Getting to see Moscow was like taking a trip back in time and tumbling into your favorite spy movie. There's a Cold War vibe that's just hard to miss. I got to admit, I loved it. But we saved the best for last, the Red Square and the spectacular show that night. Next morning, before setting off, the Q7s were run through a battery of tests to see if there were any hiccups. Fuel quality was a concern. There's no English to speak of. I mean, every sign is in Russian. So, you need help to handle these things. We breezed through Moscow city and were quick to get to the highway. We had just started to up our speed when... Whoa! Jam and how, man? We were stuck there for a long time and I was happy to swap driving duties to take in the show. If you thought Delhi is bad, if you thought Mumbai is bad, it's not a patch on what's happening here. It's tens, 20, 30 kilometer long traffic jam. People are just crawling, crawling, crawling. It's crazy and it's something similar right now, but this is of course to get out of the city. And you can see there, there you can see People are using the, I mean, there's really no hard shoulder there, but people have just run off and cutting out from the, well, the wrong side. <laughs> but that's how things work here. It was several hours later that we got out of the under construction zone and we headed straight for Nizhny. We also got a crash course in the automobiles of Russian manufacturer Gaz. President's plush limo was almost as surprising as these two experimental vehicles. Turns out one was a land speed record setting machine and the other was a turbine powered hovercraft of some sort. Nizhny Novogrod turned out to be a fascinating city where statues dot the roads and domes glisten in the skyline. The Chakolov stairs on the banks of the river Volga was one of my favorites, serene yet towering. Next morning, I was greeted by a giant statue of Vladimir Lenin. The scale and proportions of the statue just inspire awe. I almost forgot that we had to pump up tire pressures in anticipation of worsening road conditions on the way to the next city, Kazan. Slowly, I was getting used to people honking at us. Clearly, the Q7 and the Indian flag was getting people excited. Done about 200 kilometers since uh, our start in the morning. So yeah, it's been quite interesting how roads have changed, the landscape has changed. We chose to do a spot of rough roading, but the roads remained in fine nick. And soon we were in Kazan, a young and modern city with the feel of an educational hub. On our, this edition of being the global local part by the Great Quattro Drive, the learning for me continues because I've just learned that Kremlin isn't the walled city in Moscow. It's actually the name for walled cities that house government buildings. So pretty much every big city in Russia has one. There was one in the city we went yesterday. There's one here in Kazan and that's where I am right now inside the walled city. But the unique thing about this one here is that you see that there? That's a mosque. Usually, you'd see a church. Each day, we covered big distances to get to the next city. And that meant time was in short supply. 
So you'll be in Russia. And you're <laughs> heading to Ufa today where where we'll be uh, going ahead by by two hours. So that means we started off in Munich or in Ingolstadt with a time difference of three and a half hours between India and uh, Germany. And now at our current position tonight, we'll just be half an hour behind India. And ultimately, we will be three and a half hours ahead of India and come back to India. <laughs> it's phenomenal. I mean, it's we don't feel any jet lag, but still you're crossing time zones. Well, that sounds glamorous and exciting, but it was creating real problems for us on our 550 kilometer drive. When we stopped for a late lunch, it turned out it was time for tea. And for me, a vegetarian, food would have been a huge issue. Except I had come prepared. After lunch, we should have been steaming towards Ufa. That was far away, but we couldn't help but stop. These oil fields, oil pumps are all over the place. It's almost like a cottage industry of sorts, mining oil. <laughs> Towards the end of the day, we were a bit knackered, but the Q7 remained absolutely unstressed. It was a cold and misty morning the next day, but inside the cabin I was super thrilled as we were heading towards the Ural Mountains. As it turned out, the Urals are not very large in life. At just under 2000 meters tall at its highest point, I thought it was a bit unfair to categorize them with the mighty Himalayas. Hello! Hello! Ah, Nikhil! Yeah, hi Rishar, how are you? Long time, yeah? Uh, how's the weather in Asia? Are, it's nice, yeah. it's bright and sunny, it gets a bit chilly at night, but on the whole it's very good. Are, here in Europe also you've got blue skies and all that, yeah? Why don't you come over? Are, yeah, Rishar, you're in a different continent, yeah. I, I, how about we meet midway, yeah, somewhere? Okay, yeah. let's do that, let's meet midway. Yeah, now, sure. in 30 seconds? Yeah, sure, sure, come on. let's do that, okay. Bye. Oh, hi Rishar! Oh, yeah. hello. 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 hello, how are you? Europe, nice, Asia, nice. Europe, Asia. Yeah, same weather, Asia. yeah. And with that, we began our journey into Asia. A near 900 kilometer drive, how much time do you think that would take? If we don't consider breaks, then it's about 12 hours. To keep myself entertained, I've been playing small little games with the Q7. So I've been running in fuel efficiency mode. Our car is fully loaded in the sense that the trunk is absolutely packed with luggage. We have four people in this car. And still, we're managing about 14 kpl. And that's while cruising at 90, 100, 110 kilometers an hour. The really nice thing on this is, yes, of course, the eight-speed gearbox, fantastic. It lets you cruise at about 100 right now at under 1500 rpm, 40, under 1400 rpm. So that's really easy cruising. Yeah, from India. Uh, India. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> yes, sir. We were in the steps and the road streaked straight through endlessly. I was completely bowled over. The last three days have been incredible here in Russia. I mean, we'll cover two and a half thousand kilometers in these three days. And in that time, all we have seen, just open land, practically no civilization, just fields and fields in the sky. And I mean, while driving, I was just thinking in the olden days, people living here, if I lived here, I'd, I'd believe that the world was flat. Just look at it stretching out behind us over here. And then you see the clouds just draping all over it. It's just staggering. And seeing this by road, unbelievable. Yeah. 
Besides the vastness, we were also getting glimpses of the other Russian wonder, the Trans-Siberian Railway. There are two great ways to see the vastness that is Russia. One is to do the journey by road and the other is to do the journey by rail. We are already on the road journey, so I'll tell you a bit about how to do it by rail. Of course, the best way is to be on the Trans-Siberian Rail Route. Here we are in a museum that's dedicated to the trains that ply on it and it's in a town called Novosibirsk, which is the capital of Siberia. Now this town, interestingly, also exists because of this rail route. In the late 1800s, when they were developing the railway line, they couldn't find a way to cross the river Ob. This was the only point they could do it at and a hundred years later, it's grown in to become the third largest city in Russia. And we had plenty more of the vastness of Russia to contend with as we drove to Divnogorsk. Now, 600-700 km distances felt normal, but at the end of that day, there was something a bit special. I mean, for the last seven days, we've been driving along these roads where steering input means three degrees to the right and three degrees to the left. That's it. I mean, unless you're parking the car. And today we finally got corners. <laughs> it was like a part of you came back to life. And then it went away. The good thing is that in that time, I got to feel what the sport mode really does for the Q7 when you're driving hard. And I mean, we've been talking about it being more car-like to drive, more agile, more nimble. And it does feel that way through the corners as well. I was surprised with how much speed I could carry into the corners. I thought it would feel a bit out of shape, but it was pretty tidy. Of course, with the Quattro all-wheel drive system, the feel from the steering wheel hasn't been, you know, full of feedback, but still, it's decent. Often, even after driving 700, 800 kilometers, we found ourselves in the middle of nowhere. And that meant accommodations could be interesting. You've gone from carrying drag bags to drag bags. Because I only take my toilet today. Yeah? And my... Because uh, it's five floors up. It's five floors up? three, four floors, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, all these days we've been staying at... Fancy places. <laughs> Today we are in the middle of nowhere, so this is the best we could find, and we were told kind of horror stories about it. But it's really small. There's no bathroom. Else. Six people will be sharing a bathroom. What? It's not bad. It's clean, neat. That's what matters. I think today I can really feel the toll that the last couple of days have taken. 800, 700 kilometers a day. The time zone changes. We've gone through three in the last three, four days. We've lost about two and a half hours. It just hits you when you when you get to your destination in the evening. From there, we headed to the town of Baikal, famous in my books for another categorization mistake. In Russia, when we look at a water body that size, we think it is hmm, big enough to be a lake. Yes, let's call it Baikal Lake. That is the Baikal Lake. And only the Russians would call it a lake. Because in comparison to that, the Dal Lake would be a pond, right? In fact, the Baikal Lake is so big that uh, if the world's water reserves ran out and you wanted drinking water, that could supply it for 50 years. Now the resort we're staying at here in Baikal is essentially a ski resort. That was gorgeous, but <clears throat> These are the thoughts about the trees, the lake. I'm looking at that slope and thinking, hmm, could the Q7 have done it? Could we have driven it up? With off-road mode selected, ground clearance was bumped up by 60 millimeters to a massive 235 millimeters. The all-wheel drive was also locked in tight to deliver more grunt at lower RPMs. Slowly, we clambered up this massive slide 
And you know what? The Q7 climbed the near 800 meter slope. No sweat. Russia has been quite an all-encompassing test for the Q7. Definitely, I'll agree on that. <laughs> I think we've managed to use all the modes possible. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's only in Russia. Now this road that we are taking out of Baikal basically runs along Lake Baikal for over 120 kilometers or so. So we keep looking at the, I was about to call it sea, the lake. <laughs> I keep thinking, wish we could go in for a closer look. It was gorgeous, but any thoughts of going for a swim were frozen the second I dipped my feet in the water. It was biting cold, but it did manage to wake me up and we headed out for some more adventures. In Siberia, there are many beautiful creatures that you can spot. The Siberian tiger, the crane. But what we've been looking for is the Siberian train. <laughs> and we managed to get up close to a couple of them today. Uh, we even got chatting to the engine driver. They've stopped here for, I think they've got a red light, but uh, he was telling us they are headed to Ulan Ude as well. That's where we are aiming for. They intend to get there by five o'clock. And I'm sure they will. But let's see what time we get there. We were late into Ulan Ur and early out of it. Now we could see the landscape changing around us once more. It really felt like we were driving into a different geography. There were signs that we were getting closer to another country. Okay, so what's happening is uh, we are just a few meters away from the border of Russia. So we are having to just rearrange all our luggage and uh, get everything so that it's easy to cross the border. See you on the other side. <laughs> Grand entrance into Mongolia. <laughs> and if you thought the vastness was over, take a look around and... <laughs> Simply, Mongolia was mind-blowing. Nature's finest and wildest greeted us. We were blinded by rain and shot at by pellets of ice. And as if to apologize, there was a smattering of rainbows. Finally, we were greeted by mountains of fire. And there were fields of golden yellow. And somewhere in between, I saw this very strange sight. I think it was the fatigue, some hallucinations. And that was that. It was time for me to pack my bags and say goodbye to the great Quattro Drive. 